my advice is not to attempt to talk about this. You probably just get yourself in trouble, you know? Because the only way you could successfully talk about this is to be in the experience of it speaking from there. But until you get to being in the experience of it, you're talking about it conceptually. And if you don't have the experience of what you're talking about conceptually, you'll get yourself in trouble and then you'll feel like a fraud or you'll feel like you don't know what you're talking about and you feel like that, uh, that you have failed in your attempt to communicate something that you consider to be important. The best communication of these practices and teachings is in who you're being, not what you're saying. And so if you want to have a barometer for your success in terms of the practice of meditation and the understanding of these teachings, have it be that people say to you, what have you been doing? You seem calmer, you seem different, you don't get upset as much. You, what have you been doing? Then you have an opportunity to just share that I have begun to study the teachings that are the foundation of meditation and begun to practice meditation. Yeah, because who I'm talking to already knows this. Otherwise, otherwise, how could it work? You know, if I was talking about something as radical as this is and as different as this is from the ordinary way that th th things are understood, you would just be confused. You would know what the hell I was talking about. But what happens is, given that I'm talking to something that's actual, given that I'm talking to the being that you are, given I'm talking to, that I'm talking to the awareness that you are, the awareness that you are already knows what I'm talking about. That's why we say it resonates with you, you know, it vibrates with you, because you, you are this that's being spoken of here. You are what's being practiced here. And one of the things that's useful to understand is that the personality, the, the programming of the personality is programmed to resist and reject this. It's programmed to resist and reject this. This is why you have resistance to the practice of meditation. Because you're still in the, in the form and in the identity of the personality and this is about coming to see that the personality is a fraud. Coming to see that the personality doesn't actually exist, the personality is not actually alive, it's not actually possible for the personality to experience anything. And part of the program, the, given that the personality is a survival operation, it's a survival program, it's not a wellness program, it's a survival program. Given that that's the case, Anything that threatens its survival, right, it will resist and reject. It will have you fall asleep. It will have you not have enough time to meditate. It'll have you start to have doubts about this. It'll have you have all that by a thought process. It'll produce those kinds of thoughts. And that's just a program. The program is designed to resist anything that appears to threaten the continual maintenance of its exist, which is a thought process. So one of the things that will definitely threaten the maintenance of this existence of the thought process that has you believe what you are, is to not participate. I don't know if there's any other time in your life, intentionally, consciously, that you attempt to move your attention away from thinking. So that's, you know, for most people that's an oddity. That's not something that in the collective world of human beings that people are very interested in, not thinking. They're more interested in thinking. If you're talking about thinking, you've got plenty of people to talk to, right? Because thinking is revered. Thinking is considered to be important. It's, it's considered to be the way we process data that allows us to be successful. We think. The problem with that, although it works in, in terms of uh, understanding the laws that determine how things happen, 
and how things are created. It works to some degree, and because it works to some degree, we figure it must work. But it doesn't work beyond a certain point. So when you move your attention away from that activity, the, act, the programming has been programmed to, to notice that, to recognize that, to notice the absence of thinking. If there's any absence of thinking, the program starts to, tar, starts to rev up, come back. Because according to the programming that has you be the personality, if you stop thinking, you'll die. Because your existence is expressed in thinking. The personality's ex existence is expressed in thinking. It's, ex it's expressed in figuring everything out. It's, it's expressed in analyzing everything. In this ongoing process of attempting to be satisfied, happy, and peaceful. It's analyzing everything. You know, what, what will make me happy? What will give me peace? What will allow me to be satisfied? And then the commercial programming starts. Right? Because if those things are your interest, then people that are interested in making money present you with opportunities to get things or do things that will allow you to experience what you want in terms of being happy, satisfied, and peaceful. You don't need anything. See, that's one of the things that first the program will do. It'll produce thoughts to say, okay, this is how this works. You know, you, you don't, you, 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 you you need to, you know, have a certain right structure, or a certain right pattern. If you get that structure and that pattern right, you know, then you'll be, you'll be there. You'll, you'll get it. You'll get it. See, the thing is this. The reality of what you are never had a thought. Doesn't need to think. Doesn't need to think. It, it can use thinking, but it doesn't need to think. It already knows everything. It's got access to infinite wisdom. It's got access to to everything because when you let go, if you, if you completely surrender and let go of this idea that you're a body and you're a personality, you know, and you're able to stay in that state with some degree of consistency, you'll start to notice that you're everything because all there is is awareness. That's what I say and when you're practicing meditation, if there's noise from outside the room or especially on uh, Sundays when there's a, a spin class next door, right? A sound can occur in your awareness without it being something that interferes with your experience of awareness itself. Why? Because you're not listening to it. It's there, you're aware of it, but you're not listening to it. Right? This is what we're practicing with your mind, so that at some point you can get to an experience of being, you can get to an experience of being what you are as awareness, so that even if the mind's playing, right, you can be aware of it existing without listening to it, without being involved with it, without participating with it. So it's not affecting you anymore. You can get to that place. Through the practice of meditation, you can get to a place where it's no longer necessary for you to move your attention away from thinking so that you can be in a state of being and experience the possibility of being the awareness itself. If you practice long enough, even when thinking happens, right, it doesn't get in the way anymore. Because as soon as you recognize that the thinking is reactive or the thinking is, you know, the, the, the regular default state playing, the, the stuff that's concerned about you as the most important per person in the universe and all that, as soon as you notice that's where it's at, you're not interested in that. It could keep playing or it could keep come, trying to come back, right? But it, it can't succeed in coming back because even though you may be aware of it, you're not listening to it. You're not participating with it and you're not identifying with it. And you neutered it. You neutralize it, right? Because you're relating to it, uh, you're relating to it, it as it actually is, which is nothing other than a, a pattern of, thoughts, a pattern of emotions, a pattern of physical sensations, a pattern of perceptions that keeps playing in the mind. This is the life of the personality. See, look, here's the deal with the free will thing. 
everybody believes in free will. Everybody believes that free will is real. Okay. So that's why the, the, uh, the, the place to start the conversation about free will, right, is to fill in the other side of the equation. Free will isn't real. Free will doesn't exist, okay? That's actually the truth, right? However, the missing thing that has people get confused and resist the idea of no free will, right, is because they don't get that included in no free will, right, is that you have no free will about having free will. It's a paradox. You have no choice about having free will. It occurs to you as if you have free will. It's part of the program. It has to be that way because if you're going to experience a human life in a world of time and space, right, you have to be able to do things because you're separate from the rest of the universe. You have to be able to do things. Free will comes with being a separate self. Right? So that's necessary for this, it's necessary for this situation we're in to happen like that. It's necessary for you to believe you have free will. Okay? The only problem with that is unless you can see through it, unless you can see through it and understand that in a more, abs and in a more absolute sense it's not true, that what you consider you, your will and you doing is actually God's will and God's actions. Right? But you've taken, you put, the personality was put in front of that. The personality was put in front of the awareness. The awareness is your true nature. The awareness is God. The awareness is reality. The personality was put in front of that. And the awareness conceded to the situation. Yeah. The awareness is the personality right, in a very limited form in order to be in the world and live in time and space and have a body and all the rest of it, right? It conceded to put itself in the background and not be real so that a human life could occur. But that's stage one of the process. Stage two of the process is for the awareness, which is the personality in limited form that was con there was a concession made to be that, right? But it is the awareness, right? The second part of the process is for that to wake up to its nature, right? So that you don't have to stay stuck in a limited form, living in time, considering yourself to be something you're not as a physical body, which will block you from well-being. That'll block you from well-being. So you have the first part of the program, which is to be in the world, and to be in the world provides you with the possibility of, of experiencing a human life. And this can be fun, this can be exciting, this can be interesting, right? right? If you're experiencing it from a reality in which you understand it's an appearance, it's a movie. But you can understand that that's the case unless you come out of the identification as the personality in the physical body, which means the awareness is now remembering itself. The awareness is now remembering that it is the personality, it is the awareness, it is the truth, it's what's real. And once that's realized, now you can fulfill on the possibility of having a human life because well-being is now available. It can't be available when you think you're something that you're not, when, you're, when you are... See, the thing about it is, you're, you are the awareness, but the awareness has taken a second position in relationship to the personality, right? So you don't have any problem if I say to you, are you aware? It's pretty obvious, right? Nothing's clearer than that, right? But when you say, I am aware, right, what you're doing is you're, you are being the awareness that is now residing within a program. That's what you mean when you say, I am aware. The aware, you are being the awareness. The awareness is real, right? But it's residing within a program that blocks its ability to experience well-being. Because the program is not alive. The program is not real. It's the awareness that has let itself be something that is an extension of itself that doesn't have its own awakeness. It doesn't have its own aliveness. It's not real. 
It's an appearance. An appearance is, 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 is appearing to what's real. Okay? So the second half of the program is waking up so that you can have the best of both worlds. You're in the world, you have time and space, you have a body to move around, you can, you can do the doing thing, you know, and all that stuff, right? But now what happens is you realize that what you want more than anything else is available because it never wasn't available. If it's half ass, it's not a healthy situation. If you, if you only become something that isn't real, that's not fulfilling. That's not healthy. Yeah. That's living in a condition that causes suffering. Because in that condition, right, in that condition, you as the personality that has forgotten your true nature, which is where fulfillment is, which is where well-being is, right, you as a personality who has forgotten that the truth about what you are, right, is trying to get to the experience. It's trying to get to the experience that's only available when you realize your true nature. It's trying to get to that experience, right, through getting things, right? In the world we live in, in where everybody considers themselves to be a physical body and a personality, everybody's playing the game of chasing peace, happiness, and well-being. Look at it. Look at it. Look at, look at what's going on. Look at your own life in terms of what you did. You prepared yourself to do what? To make money, be successful, have possessions, right? Because everybody in the world thinks that's the game that everybody wants to win. That's why if somebody's a billionaire, that's why if somebody's a billionaire, people think, oh, even if he's crazy and does all this other stupid and crazy shit, he's a billionaire, he was successful. So he knows how to get what we all want. That's the road to hell. Everybody worships making money, getting possessions, because they're confused. They think gratification is happiness. Gratification is not happiness. Gratification is not happiness. Happiness is a natural experience. Happiness is the experience of what you actually are. And the reason you can be happy in that experience is because the awareness that you actually are doesn't need anything. It doesn't want anything. It's not going anywhere. It's already there. It's already there. It's a natural state, a natural state of well-being, happiness, and peace. You don't have to do anything to get it. It's already the case. All you have to do is relax and practice not being what you're not. Relax and practice not being what you're not. So the teachings are essential. The teachings are essential because you have to understand what you're doing when you're meditating. It's, real happiness is a state of being, it's not an emotion. Gratification is an emotion, right? Gratification. That's where the confusion lies, you know? I was listening to Rupert Spira talk about this, and the way he talked about it is he said, well, every once in a while in a human life, people experience a, a brief period of happiness. And I was surprised that he said it that way. Uh, apparently, he, he doesn't yet get that it's not happiness, it's gratification. How can it be happiness if it's... See, the happiness that I'm talking about is, is stable, it's constant, it doesn't change, it's always the same. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be a language thing once you've had a taste Does of the... Say people like go in and out of it initially? They, they think they do. You can't go in and out of something that's always there and never changes. What you're going in and out of when people say I'm going in and out of it, right? Um, they think when the personality comes back into operation that they've lost it. Right? But that's confusion. That's just confusion. You can't lose this. You didn't get it, how can you lose it? Right? It didn't start, how can it end? It's always stable and exactly the same. It's the life of the personality that's unstable and changing all the time. That's why they teach in Buddhism that, you know, the, the source of suffering is impermanence, right? Nothing stays the same, right? And human beings are attached to things, right? They get attached to their possessions. They get attached to certain experiences, right? And so whenever those experiences come, they don't want to lose them. So they get married. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Is there happiness when there's no body? 
there's always happiness when there's no body because the being that you are is not a body both ways works yeah no body and no body to be no body is happiness and not to have a body is happiness see the beauty of this is when you experience it it doesn't matter whether you can talk about it you know if you're satisfied and and you're experiencing peace and well-being you you you're home you, you know you're home you're just home and the thing that speaks louder than anything you could say hmm, is the state of being that you're in that other people will notice because they will notice that you're in a stable state of existence and they will notice that you're experiencing being alive actually experiencing that you're awake and you're alive and you're real you're authentic you actually exist now prior to waking up you don't exist thinking activity is not existence if 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 you're not practiced enough so that you you get taken back in by thinking mm -hmm. you know if the right thoughts come so even if you're even though you're practice see how this how this happens it's it's a gradual process right so uh, as you wake up you begin to experience some well-being free from these petty thoughts free from these egotistical ways of the uh, of existing right Right? So you start to experience that, so you're, you're getting fed the truth now, you're experiencing fulfillment now, but then something happens that's intense. That's not a normal thing. Something happens that's intense. You get into a car accident, or you get a diagnosis of terminal illness, right? Or your partner dies, right? Or, you know, you know something happens that's intense. So even though you're practiced, right, yeah, that the impact of that is so intense that it pulls you right out of being awake. And you're right in your head again. You're right in your mind again. And you're and you're you're right. You're right. Obsessively thinking. Oh, what happened? What's going to happen now? What do I do now? And the emotions are intense, right? So the practice is a practice that you have to do with an understanding that there will be more intense experience. There will be more intense challenges that occur, and so you're practicing for that. Right? You're practicing for the big one, right? What's the big one? Death. Yeah, death. That's why in the, you know, it's a refrigerator tonight here. <laughs> I was thinking that, but I shouldn't be accepting it. This is the way it's supposed to be. Well, you know, in the, in the Zen traditions, they had monasteries that were on mountaintops where it was really cold, and they would open all the windows <laughs> and meditate all night. Yeah, that's called TUMO. Yeah. That's being able to actually cause the temperature in your body, regardless of the atmosphere around it. <laughs> but they would sit, the monks would sit in these freezing, in this freezing, windy monastery all night long, right? Why? Why? Why would somebody do something like that, right? They would do something like that to purposely subject themselves to an uncomfortable situation so they could practice not being in their body. You know, that's why people go on retreats. Retreat, you're not going on a retreat to have fun. It's not an amusement park. You know, you go on a retreat to, it's to subject yourself to an intense and challenging experience so that you could experience that it doesn't kill you. So that you can experience your own mind. Your mind will resist it, but if you go to a retreat and you sit there eight hours a day for seven days, being still, not, a, not following the mind, making the mind adapt to what you're doing, and you do this for seven days, right? The probability of having a breakthrough is very high. Because in order to do that for seven days, right, you're sitting through the attempts of the thought process, right, to tell you this is a mistake. <laughs> you're sitting through that. 